Ta fold your roy galer knocked her son trust in the tira. My name's Connor Dullahan and I'm a collector, author, and I run a Facebook page called Early Irish Militaria. And I'm delighted to be hosting tonight's talk and speaker. Uh, before we jump in, just a quick overview of the topics for the rest of October. Uh, another uh, stellar lineup. Um, we've got Ogham, uh, we've the death of Sean Tracy, the centenary of. Uh, we have a talk on unquiet graves, uh, followed by Australia's rebel history, and last but not least, a talk on Kevin Barry. So back to tonight, delighted to be joined by Anya Foley. Uh, Anya has a bachelor's and a PhD in history from Trinity College, Dublin. And during the course of her thesis work, Anya developed an interest in the outlaws and marginalized people living in County Dublin and their violent behavior. So tonight's talk's entitled, Rape and Abduction in Ireland during the 13th and the 14th centuries. So Anya, it's over to you. Thank you. Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to dedicate this talk to Margaret McCurtain, who died, who just died. I mean, she was a pioneer in women's history and women's studies and a feminist. I think she'd be a great loss. So I'm hoping that this paper will be a little bit of a contribution to women's history in Ireland. Now, in this paper, I will be examining sexual violence experienced by women in later medieval Ireland, mainly the late 13th and early 14th centuries. Though I occasionally go beyond that chronology. Though the focus of the paper will be on Ireland, I will also use examples of rape and abduction in Britain because I feel that this will illustrate the shared experience of women who found themselves in, in violent situations. It will fill in some of the gaps in the Irish records and it will show the variation in records between both jurisdictions. Now, though the topic of rape is, an entire, is at the extremely violent end of the spectrum of women's experiences, I do believe that looking at records that deal with rape and abduction can also be very revealing in regards to attitudes towards women in general. Now, I will begin by discussing what records survive from medieval Ireland that can inform us about women's experiences of rape and abduction. Anyone who researches Irish history will be aware of the great calamity that befell our archives almost a century ago in 1922, when the Public Records Office of Ireland was destroyed in an explosion. And there's a picture of people picking up fragments from the explosion. Most of Ireland's administrative records were lost, including the court rolls, of the Justiciar's Court and the Common Bench from the medieval period. The administration of royal justice in late, medi in late medieval Ireland was conducted in the Justiciar's Court. And for those of you who don't know, the Justiciar was the English King's representative in Ireland. Therefore, the Justiciar's Court was the equivalent of the King's Bench in Ireland. And we also had the Common Bench and itinerant justices. And these were judges who traveled around the lordship dispensing justice. In fact, the justiciar himself rarely stayed in one place and the court followed him wherever he went. These court records are the key resource for anyone researching crime or violence in medieval Ireland. So what was lost in the explosion of 1922? Now, in terms of court records, the destruction of the Public Records Office was devastating and almost all the original documents were destroyed. Before the explosion, um, 488 medieval plea rolls were stored here. Afterwards, only three complete rolls and various fragments of other rolls survive. Unfortunately, before the explosion, no, I mean, fortunately, not unfortunately. Fortunately, before the explosion, the calendaring of these valuable records had begun. Though what survives cannot possibly make up for the devastating loss in so much of our past. To date, the justiciary rolls dating from 1295 to 1314 have been published. Now, what exactly survived the explosion? Two original justiciary rolls from the regnal years 6 to 7 Edward II, which is 1312 to 1313, and the common rank bench roll from 
6 Edward IV, which is 1466 to 1467. Also, two roles that had gone astray sometime before the explosion found their way back to the Public Records Office of Ireland in the 1960s. One is a judiciary role from Edward II's reign, and the other is a common role from Henry V's reign. The National Archives of Ireland, which was previously the Public Records Office, has, also has unpublished calendars, which were created in the 19th century. And there's just a list of them here. And the most important ones are RC7 and KB2, though some P rolls can also be found in RC8. Other calendars and copies of court proceedings can be found in the Royal Irish Academy, the National Library of Ireland, and the National Archives of the United Kingdom. And of course, there's, also, there's always a chance that more material will be found in the future. Now, statutes were another important record to deal with sexual violence, and I will discuss the statutes that deal with rape and abduction in more detail shortly. Exchequer records can also be useful. They do not record the actual crimes themselves, but when men were found guilty of rape, they had to pay a fine to the court they, or to the crown. These fines were recorded in the exchequer receipts. Because the Crown was worried that Irish officials were embezzling money out of the Exchequer, they demanded that a copy of all Exchequer payments and receipts were, was sent to the English Exchequer in Westminster. So even though the Exchequer records were destroyed in 1922, their duplicates were stored in England and can now be accessed at the National Archives of the United Kingdom in Kew. The exchequer records can be vague and sometimes just record that individuals paid fines for unspecified trespasses. Like this example from the 20th of October 1317, where Philip, son of Walter de Riddlesford of Connacht, paid a fine of five marks for trespass. Now, I'm not suggesting that Philip was a rapist. I just wanted to show you what an original exchequer record looks like. Now, other entries do give us a little bit more information. Um, like this one from the late 13th century, which specified that the fines were for rape. And Mota Lawless is the only victim that I've found so far who's mentioned by name in these records, the only, the only victim of rape. Men also received pardons for committing rape, and these pardons can be found among the chancery letters for medieval Ireland. The records of the Chancery are gone, but they have been re reconstructed and can be found on the Circle website. And here are a few examples of pardons for rape. You can just see here. And there's also um, a few cases of abduction as well, like this one, um, where, Mar where Margaret Jenico, alias Dartus, um, was, she actually said she wasn't abducted nor carried against her will. So they didn't have to pay a fine on this occasion. And as you can see in this, uh, they actually use the term rap to. And I'm going to look a little bit at the language that's used in the sources. Now, the language can be ambiguous. For example, raptus can mean either rape or abduction, or both. Particularly from the end of the 13th century onwards, when the first and second statutes of Westminster, which, which were issued in 1275 and 1285, combined these two different offences under one common law. And both of these statutes were enforced in Ireland in 1285. The legal historian J.P. Post, and here's the second one, now you can see in this one it says the king prohibits any that do ravish or take by force any maiden underage or any other woman against her will. And that's now the statutes for 1285, which is very similar to the 1275 statute. Now, the legal historian J.P. Post argued that these offences were combined so that courts could punish abduction, abductions that were consensual. This might suggest that the courts were more concerned about opportunistic men abducting women for material gain or social advancement than they were, uh, for, uh, than they were for about violence against women. Now, a statute from Richard II's reign, and Richard II reign, uh, reigned at the end of the 13th century, towards the end of the 13th century. 
Now, further shifted the onus for pursuing rapists and abductors onto the family of the victim rather than the woman herself. And you can see that there it's highlighted in the PowerPoint. This is perhaps another indication that there was more concern about the financial and material loss suffered by the women's relatives than her own personal well-being. In Scotland, there really isn't any statutes comparable to those enforced in Ireland and England. There is one statute from 1318 stating that if anyone in the army commit rape, that he should be indicted before the justiciar. So it's a pretty vague, um, it's a pretty vague law. Now, some court records do not explicitly say that women were raped, though the connotation is there. In 1277, Nicholas Macdonough was found guilty of ravishing the unnamed daughter of Nicholas, the master of the school of Ballymore, which is probably Ballymore Eustace. His punishment was not recorded. In the same year, Roger de Crumlin, who I assume came from Crumlin, was acquitted of ravishing Sarah de Norris. And though ravish can, can mean seduce, in the medieval period it had a more negative connotation. That of seizing someone by violence and carrying them away, though it did not always necessarily mean sexual violation. It comes from the Latin rapier, so it has the same root as the word rape. So how frequently was rape mentioned in the sources? Actually, very rarely. A play role dating to 6 Edward I, which covers the years 1277 up to 1278, contain just nine cases where men were accused of rape and there is no mention of any abductions in this role. It is likely that rape was underreported in the sources and that reflects modern trends. For example, studies in the United States suggest that only between 25 and 50% of completed or attempted rape cases are reported to the police. And even the ones reported normally don't end up leading to a conviction. In 1978, 635 rape complaints are made to police in Seattle and Kansas City. Only 32 of these cases went to trial, and of these, only 10 defendants were convicted of rape. In the medieval plea roll from Edward I's reign, the defendants were acquitted in four of the cases. This does not mean that the defendants in the other five cases were found guilty. In most instances, they never showed up at court and were outlawed in their absence. In another plea roll that covers cases heard on the King's Bench from the 3rd of November 1317 up to the 7th of May 1318, there was just one case involving rape and the accused was acquitted because he had received a pardon from the King. In the same role, there are 78 cases where individuals were accused of robbery. So rape was definitely underreported when compared to other serious crimes. And this does seem to tally with research done on rape in medieval England. Unfortunately, because of the patchy survival of the records and the fact that rape cases probably rarely made it to court, it's difficult to estimate how serious a problem rape and abduction was in medieval Ireland. As well as that, we are reliant on 19th century transcriptions and sometimes very bad transcriptions. And they were often very selective about what they transcribed. Many calendars are little more than extracts and people copied what interested them. It's even possible that they didn't copy material that they considered unsavory. So some may have simply not transcribed um, cases dealing with rape. Now I'm going to look at rape and abduction separately because abduction wasn't always an act of sexual violence. And I will discuss rape first. Technically, rape was one of the few crimes that women could prosecute independently of their kinsmen, according to Bracton, a 13th century legal expert. But the truth, however, was that women appeared in a wide range of medieval court records, particularly records dealing with land disputes and other civil cases. Women are often named in these documents along with their husbands. In some cases, women withdrew their accusations of rape, and the sources hint that at least on some occasions, this was because both parties had decided to settle outside court. In one case in Blackburn in Lancashire in 1292, where a married daughter of William de Hoddersford withdrew charges of rape that she had made against Henry, son of 
Henry of Canliffe, the court decided to press ahead anyway, and the jury found him guilty. Henry was fined one mark for the rape, and his victim, Amaria, was fined 10 shillings for withdrawing the claim. There are other examples of women claiming rape and then withdrawing. It is possible that this was because they had not been raped in the first place, but it's also possible that rapist and victim had come to some sort of settlement outside of court. It is, it is likely that some women were intimidated into dropping their accusations against their rapists. Men could certainly behave violently towards women who accused them of rape. In Loud, in 1306, after Richard Hamas was acquitted of raping Agnes Score, he beat her up and she was, paid half a mark, she was paid half a mark in compensation and Richard was sent to jail. Um, which would suggest that Richard was a fairly violent person and probably um, well able to commit rape. Now, unfortunately, in some cases, what sort of settlement both parties reached is not made explicit in the sources. But one case from Dublin in 1310 does offer some clues. And it's, a, like, it's a, quite a detailed case, as you can see here. Richard Tyrrell of Castle Knock and pled guilty to the rape of Eva, daughter of William. Now, William's full name doesn't survive, but looks to me like it's London. So William de London. This is, particularly un this is a particularly unpleasant case because Eva was 11 years old at the time for rape. Richard Tyrrell was pardoned on the condition that he provide Eva with a husband when she came of age. Now, it's possible that, that in other rape cases, the injured, injured parties came to a similar settlement, they just didn't do it through the court system. So Richard Tyrrell was forced to pay a large fine to the Crown, and he had several pledges who promised he would pay the fine, which indicates that Eva was of high social status. Why would Richard rape Eva, apart from the fact that he was probably a paedophile? It is possible that he raped her because of who she was related to. Around the time Richard raped Eva, his cousin Thomas Tyrrell was accused of being an accomplice in the murder of John de Bonneville. John was married to Matilda, the widow of Thomas de London, who may have been Eva's grandfather if the name is London in the source. Bonneville was a close associate of John Fitzthomas, future first Earl of Kildare, and the Tyrrells were associates of Arnold Le Poir, who had been acquitted of murdering John de Bonneville, though it's very likely that Arnold actually did murder him. Now, women were often abducted to humiliate their families and demonstrate that their families weren't able to protect them. Now, Eva may have been raped for similar reasons. Maybe it was to humiliate her family. Now, obviously, not all accusations of rape were true, and women who made accusations against men and were either proved to be liars or who did not pursue their cases could be punished by the courts. For example, in Landale, Lancashire, in 1292, when adduced the hail, accused Simon, son, son of William of Allerton, of rape, the courts ordered her arrest when she did not come to court to sue her appeal. In the same year, also in Lancashire, Goddard, daughter of Richard of Ray, accused Henry of Winmarley of raping her when she was a virgin. But he was able to prove that, that three years earlier, Goddard had a child and obviously wasn't a virgin. Of course, he may have still raped her. Just all that the source means is she wasn't a virgin at the time. Glanville, who wrote the treatise on the laws and customs of the Kingdom of England in the 12th century, advised that any woman who was raped had to show the injuries inflicted on her, particularly any bleeding or ripped clothes. Glanville may have been referring to the torn hymen, indicating that the, women, that the woman was a virgin when she was raped. Loss of virginity could potentially reduce a woman's marriage prospects. And therefore, some may have wanted to publicise the fact that her virginity had been taken by force. Women did report bleeding in the court records, but the women could not have been always virgins, since some of them were married at the time of their attack. Does this suggest that sometimes the attacks were so violent that they drew blood, or was the language used by clerks who recorded these cases so formulaic 
that they automatically added in these details. As you can see from these examples from 1293, um, the Lancashire Air Rose, uh, the language used is um, almost identical in these different cases. Um, they specified that the woman was made bloody. Certainly some rapes were acts of extreme violence. In 1277, in Rathini County, Tipperary, Alice DeMond's private parts were so badly crushed by an individual called Purcell that she died from her injuries. However, I haven't come across any reference, at least so far, in the Irish pleros of women claiming to have bled because of their rape. There is, however, certainly a sense that the rape of a virgin was more serious than that of a married woman. The rape of a nun would have been considered particularly shocking. And there's one very infamous case of the rape of a nun in medieval Ireland, which was instigated by Dermot McMurrah, King of Leinster in, 30, in 1132. In order, and he did this in order to have his niece installed as the abbess of Kildare. He had the current abbess put into a man's bed therefore making her ineligible for the office of abbess. I haven't come across another case similar to this where a powerful Christian lord instigates the rape of a nun, and I would certainly be interested in hearing about any other cases if, if, there, if they exist, though I suspect that Dermot might be um, unique in this regard. And I would also question if not being a virgin would prevent a woman from being a nun or an abbess, considering the cases of the sons of nuns getting papal dispensations to become priests and the accusations of some monks and abbots of being found in nunneries where they weren't meant to be, and the nunneries were described as forbidden places in the sources. So there's a lot of references in the papal registers um, to monks and abbots being, interacting with nuns, even though I'm sure it was all innocent, not. So what punishment could rapists and abductors um, expect to receive? According to Bracton in his On the Laws and Customs of England, written in the mid 13th century, anyone who raped a virgin, and it's interesting that he specifies virgin here, anyone who raped a virgin should have his eyes put out and he should also lose as well the testicles which excited his hot lust. And rather bizarrely, any animals he had with him at the time of the rape would also be castrated and their tails cut off and birds had their beaks cut off as well. In reality, the worst punishment most rapists faced was a fine. When Morris de Bat was found guilty of ra raping Alice Walner in Tipperary in 1313, he was fined a considerable sum of 40 pounds. Anyone who committed rape and was Execute usually commit several other types of crime as well, especially robbery. Therefore, it can't be said that they were executed because they were rapists. Their punishment was probably closely linked to their social status and the social status of the victim. In some cases, the perpetrator was dead before it came to court. And it may be that the victim's friends and family dealt with the matter themselves. Even when men were accused of multiple sexual offences, they would no more likely be convicted. For example, in 1313, John Lyle was charged of breaking into the home of Clarence Fontaine and assault Lana and ravishing them. He is also accused of striking Marjorie Crane with a lance, killing her. And he's all, he was also accused of being a common robber, but was acquitted of all charges. Now, most men who did not turn up in court in court for trial were usually outlawed. So the court may have assumed that they were guilty because innocent men would have shown up to clear their names. Well, that's the theory anyway. When John Gaynard was accused of raping the daughter of Peter de la Bear in 1277, he was outlawed. 20 years later, Curwell McCurwell um, fled when he was accused of raping Alice Norman, who appears to have been English judging by her surname, and he was, he was subsequently outlawed. In the same year, John de la Roche was outlawed when he fled the jurisdiction after he was accused of raping Mabilla Percival. Though there was a low conviction rate for rape, men who were Gaelic Irish in origin could expect to be found guilty more often than their English counterparts. 
particularly if they raped English women. And when I say English women, I mean women, English women in Ireland, people who claim to be English, they weren't really English, they were Irish. Now, particularly if they're raped English women, like in the case involving Curwell McCurwell here and Alice Norman. In 1277, Nicholas Macdonagh was found guilty of ravishing the unnamed daughter of Nicholas, the master of the school of Ballymore, who I've already mentioned. And so, I mean, it's, it's not clear if the woman here in this case was English or Irish, though. So many men were also acquired pardons after they raped women. In 1317, Robertson of John Le Poir of Clonfade in, well, in Waterford was accused of ravishing the daughter of Geoffrey Mackley, who was a, and she was a virgin at the time. In court, Robert claimed that the king had pardoned him of all felonies committed before the 1st of May of that year, and the jury acquitted him. Now, this did not mean that Le Poir was innocent, and it's unlikely he would have needed a pardon if he was though the pardon may have been sought to protect him from being punished for other criminal activity and may not have to do with the rape at all. Men who acquired pardons rarely claimed to be innocent of the crimes of which they were being accused. This must have been a very frustrating process for those who brought their assailants to court. The men who received pardons were usually of high social status who could afford to buy themselves out of trouble. The Crown was also reliant on these men, on these class of men in the administration of the colony of Ireland. So they often turned a blind eye to their bad behavior. Now, abduction could also result in a hefty financial punishment. In 1306, when Herbert de Maris was found guilty of carrying away Marjorie Russell, a widow, he was fined 200 pounds which probably reflects how wealthy Marjorie was. Now, it's not clear whether Herbert actually just abducted her or raped her as well. So this took place in Cashel. So I'm turning mainly to abduction here now for the next little bit. Now, as I've already mentioned, the offences of rape and abduction were combined under common law. This was in spite of the fact that all abductions involved rape. Moreover, in many cases, they weren't even violent events where the women were carried away unwillingly. Some women cooperate in their abductions. I would perhaps be more accurate to call these examples elopements rather than abductions. Therefore, when I was looking at the sources, I tried to separate those that I felt were not violent in nature. Cases, for example, like that of the very unfortunately named Isol de Lahore uh, from County Wexford. In 1312, Robert, Ste Robert, no, in 1312, Roger, excuse me, Steve and Geoffrey and Nicholas Furlong were accused of abducting her against her will, but Isol had gone with Roger of her own free will and became his mistress. Occasionally, even where though the abductions were not planned in advance or agreed to by the women involved, they sometimes led to happy unions, like the case in 1288 when William Douglas, who was the ancestor of the Earls of Douglas of Scotland, had abducted the widow Eleanor de Levain, daughter-in-law of the Earl of Derby, from Fastid Castle in East Lothian in Scotland. They were married shortly afterwards, and Douglas paid Edward, Edward I, King Edward I, a hundred pounds fine for the marriage in February 1290. Eleanor also paid the same fine of a hundred pounds, not knowing that her husband had already paid it. So she seemed to be pretty keen to keep him. Later that year, when Douglas was imprisoned by the English king, Eleanor posted bail for him, which she probably wouldn't have done had she been forced into the marriage or she didn't like him. Women sometimes arrange their abductions to get away from husbands who are violent, cruel, or who they simply did not get on with. A famous example in Ireland is that of Dervigil, daughter of Mercata Ume Lachlan, King of Mead. And she was also the wife of Tiernan O'Rourke, King of Breffany. And she was abducted by Dermot McMurrah. And he was the guy who had a nun raped that we talked about a few minutes ago. And she was abducted in 1152. 
Dorothy Gill appears to have been a willing accomplice in her own abduction, and the fact that she took her cattle and chattels with her suggests that it was well organised. Dorothy Gill may have been unhappy with her husband, or her paternal Mead family may have been trying to forge an alliance with Leinster. We don't really know why she decided to, to go with Dermot. Dermot's reasons were much more clear. Since O'Rourke, Dervigal's husband, had tried to conquer Leinster 20 years earlier, he was clearly trying to settle some old scores. Most people agree that it wasn't a love match because Dermot was in his 60s at the time. And, and at this point, to quote the historian F.G. Byrne, Dervigal may have been fair, but she was certainly 40. Now, Michael Prestwich reveals a similar ageist attitude towards the abduction of a wealthy heiress, Alice, Countess of Lincoln, who had previously been married to Thomas, Earl of Lancaster. In 1336, Alice was abducted by Hugh de Frains from Bolingbroke Castle and then was apparently raped. Prestwich concludes that Frains was more interested in her fast estates because Alice was in her mid 50s at the time of her abduction. This was the second time in her life that Alice had been, had been abducted. While she was still married to the Earl of Lancaster in 1317, she was abducted by the household knights of John de Warren, Earl of Surrey, a nephew by marriage of King Edward II. The motive for this abduction was to, humili was to humiliate the Earl of Lancaster, who had an antagonistic relationship with the Earl of Surrey. So Surrey seems to have had similar motives to Dermot McMurray. Alice, like Dervigil, may have been a willing participant in her abduction. Lancaster appears to, have been, appears to have neglected her and had several mistresses. And even though he was concerned about her property, there's no evidence that he ever tried to get her back. These two abductions were separated by more than a century and a half, but do share many similarities. In both cases, the abductor's aim was to humiliate the victim's husband, or there were acts of revenge for perceived wrongs originally done to the abductor by the husband. They may have also given these women the opportunity to get away from husbands that, for whatever reasons, they did not want to be with. In many cases, the women who were abducted were of high social status, were of higher social status than their abductors. In fact, this appears to have been the case with Alice of Lincoln and her second husband, Sir Abolo Lestrange, though there is no evidence that he actually abducted her, and it appears to have been a love match. Being of high social status may have increased the potential for violence for these women. It was not enough to abduct them. If men wanted to marry these women, the relationship had to be consummated, and many women must have been raped. Women of the gentry and merchant class who had property were also attractive targets for opportunistic poorer men. For example, in York in 1411, Agnes, the widow of a wealthy poor called Hugh Grantham, married draper John Thornton. Afterwards, she was taken to court by John Dale, who claimed he had previously contracted marriage with Agnes. Agnes confirmed that she had actually agreed to marry Dale, but that she had been forced to do so because he had abducted her and threatened to rape her. Unlike Torn Thornton, Dale was not a wealthy man and his motivations appear to have been for material gain because the court records revealed that Agnes was a woman of great age. It is likely that Agnes married John Thornton to protect herself from the unwelcome attentions of opportunists like, Doyle, like Dale. There are also cases of rape and abduction by Irish men in England, and because of the dearth of court records for medieval Ireland, I think it would be very useful to go through English court records to examine the cr criminal behaviour of the Irish in England. Now, a statute from 1422 ordered that no Irishman should reside in Oxford or Cambridge unless they had letters from the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland testifying that they were loyal subjects of the king. The reason for this was that people born in Ireland were suspected of committing a wide array of crimes, including rape and abduction. A century earlier, in 1315, Jack La Irish and his gang abducted Lady Maud de Clifford when she was travelling on the road close to Bowes Castle in Yorkshire. Her husband, Sir Robert, had just been killed at the Battle of Bannockburn. Maud also happened to be a member of the Anglo-Irish nobility. 
Her father was Thomas de Clare, Lord of Tomond, and her mother was Juliana Fitzgerald, the daughter of Morris, Lord of Offaly. Edward II had invited both Anglo-Irish magnates and Gaelic-Irish chieftains to participate in a Scottish campaign. So there would have been a substantial number of Irishmen in England at this time. And those involved in military activity were often also involved in criminal activity. The, the Irish family appeared to have been based in Kildare. And Jack the Irish was of relatively high social status because he was accompanied by 160 men at arms and he served as keeper of Barnard Castle, which is a very substantial castle uh, in, in Durham. The Irish probably hoped to marry Maud, who was a wealthy widow after the death of her husband, but she was rescued four days after her abduction. He does not seem to have suffered for his bad behaviour and he was still serving the crown a year later. And Andy King has written a very interesting article on Jack the Irish that's really worth reading. Okay, so some years earlier in Lancashire, um, Alan of Ireland, the miller, was accused of striking Edda, the daughter of Bennett the Watchman, and killing her. Edda was pregnant at the time, and it is possible that Alan was the father since no husband is mentioned. It is unknown if there was a sexual element to this act of violence, because since the victim was dead, she could not make this accusation against him. And if Alan was her husband, he would not be accused of rapes and sexual assault against a spouse was not illegal. The Alice de Mont case mentioned earlier, where she died because of the injuries she received during her rape, highlights that many victims of murder may have suffered sexual violence before their deaths. And while some of these rapes and murders must have been committed by strangers, it is likely that most women knew those who raped and murdered them. Even in the case where women were murdered by husbands or sexual partners, there may have been an element of sexual violence. For example, in 1297, uh, Thomas, the son of Elias of Wexford, murdered his wife Agnes in their marital bed while she slept. In cases like this, it's hard to say if women experienced sexual violence or not. The sources can be ambiguous and violence within marriage is rarely mentioned in these sources, unless the wife, or very rarely the husband, is murdered or seriously injured, as in the cases involving Agnes and Alice. One famous case is that of Christopher St. Lawrence, seventh Baron of Hoth who in the late 16th century killed his 13-year-old his daughter and was accused of beating his wife severely on at least two occasions. The jury fined him a thousand pounds and declared that he deserved death for his behaviour. Nonetheless, St. Lawrence's trial appears to have been politically motivated and he had a lot of enemies in the Irish administration. That is not to say that he was innocent, but it's likely that he had not made, that if he had not made powerful enemies, his bad behaviour would have been tolerated or covered up. Christopher St. Lawrence is certainly a very violent individual, but husbands chastising and punishing their wives was certainly not only tolerated, but expected, as long as they did not go too far and inflict serious injury. Women who were involved with outlaws were also exposed to potential violence. I have found a substantial number of women in later medieval Ireland who had relationships with criminals and outlaws. And it's very difficult to tell if these relationships were consensual. From some of the cases that I've already mentioned, I believe that there is, a strong, that there is strong evidence that some women were assaulted as a means of humiliating their um, kinsmen, as I've already mentioned. I've also found some evidence in the court records that suggests that violent individuals could use their sexual relationships with women con to control these women's kinsmen. For example, Adam Osmere complained that an outlaw called Robert Lafoire was holding his daughter as a concubine and fisting Adam's house against his will to talk to her. Adam said that he was afraid of confronting the outlaw, possibly fearing what he would do to his daughter and the rest of his family. There are several examples of women and particularly Gaelic Irish women having relationships with outlaws in court records. But it's difficult to ascertain whether these women were with these men willingly or through coercion. Some sources can be problematic and they don't really give a clear indication as to if women were engaging in sexual activities because they wanted to, 
or because they were forced to. In many cases, it is difficult to establish how much choice women had in these relationships. Henry Tyrrell, a cousin of the Richard Tyrrell of Castlenock, who, as I've already mentioned, raped the young 11-year-old Eva, was an outlaw accused of committing adultery with Arnold Penry's wife. And Arnold Penry lived in the manor of Sagard in southwest Dublin. Now, Arnold claimed that um, Henry Tyrrell brought her with him on his travels um, and brought her into countryside with him. Now, the court record doesn't reveal her name or if she was a willing companion. I have to admit that when I first examined this record, I assumed that she was going with him willingly and that they were almost like Bonnie and Clyde committing crimes across the countryside. I think that I may have been guilty of reading too much into it. It's really impossible to say if she had given consent to this or not. In 1311, when Wasmir O'Kenwin was accused of receiving a group of outlaws into his home, he claimed that they were sleeping with his wife and daughter and that he did not do anything because he feared they would kill him. Again, the names of the women are not recorded. Like in the case of Adam Osmir, Wasmir O'Kenwin claimed that he was too afraid of Robert, the, of Robert the Outlaws to stop him. And yet again, his wife and daughter are not named in the sources. There is no indication in any of the, that any of these women wanted to be with these men, or if their fathers or husbands, or if like their fathers and husbands, they were afraid of them. Okay, so in conclusion, what do these records tell us in regards, to, tell us in regards to medieval perceptions about women? They certainly suggest that some women were perceived as having more value than others. In some cases, men raped and abducted women because they could expect economic or political gains for doing so. Men who married wealthy widows enjoyed advantages in terms of social status and wealth, even if these women were forced to marry them against their will. It was also possible to settle scores with enemies and humiliate them by targeting their female relatives. They also ran the risk of punishment or revenge if the social gap between them and the women they raped and abducted was too wide. However, men who raped and abducted women of lower social status didn't face those kinds of risks and men may have targeted women of Gaelic Irish origin because they knew they were less likely to be punished for assaulting them and their kinsmen were less likely to be able to gain any sort of revenge or restitution. In her book, Stolen Women, Caroline Dunn argues that while it would be going too far to say that women were simply seen as possessions, their value was measured by the status and influence of their male relatives. This is certainly borne out in the Irish play roles. Nearly every single case I've referred to has defined women by the relationships of men. They were daughters or mothers, wives or widows, mistresses or concubines. They were not intrinsically important in themselves, and sometimes they were not even given a name. They were important because of the men who they were related to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anya. Well done. My goodness. First of all, how do you even interpret the 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 words, <laughs> the the language? What's the script? Well, I mean, like I was saying, I mean, we're mainly like looking at things like calendars. So I was even looking at something last night. And I mean, I really wish we had the originals. I mean, it's we have very little like original material. Um, yeah. So, I mean, a lot of it is guesswork and a lot of it is, I mean, like I was saying, I mean, the language is very ambiguous. I mean, raptus can mean abduction or rape. I mean, yeah. there's, there's cases where women, you know, raptus their children. I mean, they abduct their children. Yeah, yeah obviously they're not raping them. No, you know? yeah. You know? So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's sort of, uh, especially in Ireland, because we've lost so much of our original, um, uh, so much of our original material. I mean, that's why I use English material as well, just to see the variations between that and Ireland. But it's oh, hard, you know. Gotcha. So I've got a question here from Liam. Has Anya compared the prevalence of rape and abductions of females in medieval times versus its prevalence in more modern times? So, for example, you know, as a percentage of overall crime, is it increasing or decreasing? Well, I mean, and that's the problem with the records again. I mean... Like, for example, like we have a complete, we've a pretty good run of records from 1295 to about 13, 15, 16, 17. 
but you can't really get long-term trends out of that. So we wouldn't have the sort of material that we would have for modern cases. But I mean, even with modern cases, I mean, they're very underreported, you know? So we don't even know, I think, the true depth of the amount of rapes that go on, even in modern Ireland. As well as that, I mean, I did use an example in my paper. I looked at rapes in um, two cities in America in the 1970s. Yeah, Seattle but and Kansas, yeah. Yeah, because we have DNA evidence now, we didn't, we wouldn't have had that, like before, you know, in the last, yeah, for the last twenty five years, I suppose. So, I mean, even though you're not seeing a big increase in convictions, even with DNA, so it is sort of problematic. But I mean, you can look at, you can certainly look at records before DNA became a thing, and sort of, you can sort of, maybe compare them a little bit but I think you'd be better off doing it for England which has a much more constant um, amount of records it's just it's a real problem in Ireland after about 13 17 you're just seeing stuff in records like you know chancery letters and exchequer records and they're not actually uh, describing the rapes they're just you know describing fines that people got for raping people but we're not getting the details about what women went through you know yeah I think uh, Margaret Furlong here uh, commented because she saw an ancestor of hers from Wexford, her name being mentioned. I, I actually, the same thing when you mentioned Dowdle from 1467, there's Dowdles in my family tree. So I think we're, we're, we're seeing a few names pop up. <laughs> I think uh, most people are very dogs here back then. But yeah, I know actually, no, they're not all high status at all. I mean, those Gaelic Irish women would have been peasantry. You know, yeah. the, I mean, but the men who are raping them would be a very high, so would be fairly high social status. They'd be kind of middle class, I suppose, by modern standards. There would be the gentry, they were called gentry at that time, but they would be like the middle class of modern times. So, I mean, and they could do it, they could get away with it because those women, these women were poor and were Gaelic Irish as well. And of course, you know, <laughs> I mean, they probably were second hand citizens. They weren't even citizens, they were outside law, but, um, you know, they would have been treated, they wouldn't have been treated as well as the English of Ireland. Okay. So Mary Ann uh, Maher just asked our, this is both a statement and a question. So we almost think that a criminal case being brought against someone accused of rape as a more modern phenomenon. So was Anya surprised by the level of prevalence in medieval times? Well, Rape was considered one of the most like serious crimes you could commit in the medieval period. I mean, there was four, there was four crimes that could only be heard in the king's court, and that was murder, robbery, rape, and arson. So those four, they were considered the most serious crimes. So rape was always considered serious as a very serious crime. But at the same time, it doesn't turn up that much compared to those other, compared to murder, compared to arson, compared to robbery, it doesn't come up as much. So I think my guess is that people settle these matters privately. I mean, they might kill the person who committed a rape, you know, to hurt the families, might cause family feuds and things like that. But I say a lot of these cases never got to a court. Okay. Um, another one here, is there any relation between the punishments for abduction or rape to Brehan laws? Um, oh, that's interesting. Mm. Um, I don't think there is. I, mean, I actually think in Brehan law, and I'm not an expert on like Gaelic law at all. I mean, I think it would have been similar actually with fines, I think. I think people would have probably had to pay some sort of fine. I don't think people were executed. Now, someone who could be an expert in Gaelic Ireland could come on and contradict me completely because I'm not an expert. But my guess is it would be, it would be fine because I think that that's, in Irish law, punishment is sort of very much tied in with fine, fines as well, you know? I think people are, surpri are surprised that people weren't, like, didn't have any sort of physical punishment that was mostly fines, you know? That surprised me, actually. And in terms of the language uh, in the existing records, is it English? Is it Latin? What is it? Yeah, it's more, it's Latin. Um, it's all like, we're, we're like for, if you want to like, like look at sort of the medieval like plea rolls, I mean, we're quite lucky because 
they were translated um, in the sort of in the 20th century. So they are in English and they are accessible to people who want to read them. You know, they are, but they would have originally been in Latin. And there's still a lot of stuff, a lot of the calendar stuff is still in Latin and has to be, um, has to be translated and published properly. Okay. Anya, we got a lot more questions here and a lot of good comments, you know, in terms of people appreciating you coming on. So Great. what we'll probably do is we'll probably, Liam can drop these into you in a message afterwards instead of. Brilliant. Um, so on behalf of everybody, thanks again, Anya. Appreciate no you coming on. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.